Welcome back, Achievers, to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of September 1st, 2022. I always love when we fall out of the first. It's very serendipitous. Um, I have with me today a new host, a new co-host for the week. Uh, very excited. Someone I've met really recently, actually. Um, Dan Prindle, founder of Podcast PXN. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. This is great. Hi, thank you for joining me now. If you follow me on Twitter, you you know the escapades that me and Podcast PSN Korea had gotten in, and uh, this was um, a very nice day. I was able to get you on relatively quickly from then too, because uh, uh, we've been having so much fun over the last few weeks. Of course, with the debacle of Jeopardy, followed by the stealing of several games that I love dear to me in the 2000s best exclusive little brackets you guys did. But you guys are doing fun stuff over there. I've had great times uh, tuning in. Absolutely. Thank you, man. And uh, I, I tried to get your games. I tried. Yeah, well, <laughs> I tried to get you to the $20, I guess. <laughs> Let's get into the show for the week. We're going to do a not so rapid, rapid fire to start the show off. And then we're going to settle down with something right after. This is going to be uh, via Nibelian. So I first found this actually from Nibelian. Uh, both Sony and Tencent will increase their shares. Um, but let's go over the write up that I have over here. In an interesting move by both parties involved, Sony and Tencent have purchased large portions of Elden Ring developer from, Soft's, uh, from Softwares from their original stockholder. Sony, back in 2021, announced a, quote, capital alliance, and quote, befitting Sony with 1.93% stock in the company holding the majority stake, which is Kadokawa. Kadokawa. Pretty sure I, I nailed that. Japanese media conglomerate. In that same year, Tencent acquired a 6.86% stake in the company as well for the same reason, just generating capital in a, quote, capital alliance. And now we see both companies raise their shares considerably to generate more capital. Sony now owns 14.1% from software and Tencent. The Chinese mega corporation with open ties to the CCP has now a 16.3% hold of the company, making it the second largest shareholder, of course, behind Kadokawa. Owning the majority. As a reminder, all the way back in 2014, that same company acquired the publisher by acquiring 80% of the company. This is very interesting to wake up to. These are clearly two very motivated uh, people in FromSoft upping their stakes into the <laughs> into the company uh, to potentially do something with it. Now, those are small compared to, of course, the 80% they started with. They probably have, what, probably roughly around... Uh, the high 60s, uh, since they were probably selling some to generate some capital or whatnot. But I don't know. I don't think this is uh, moves of any kind. This is probably just Tencent and Sony just acquiring more stakes, uh, just in case there's some conversations maybe later in the future to buy from Katokawa. But I can't imagine that that's even in the realm of cost possibility. What do you think? Yeah, uh, it's interesting that you say it's not in the realm because, like, uh, we were joking on the podcast this week that uh, <laughs> I was like, hey, uh, is this a race for who can buy uh, from soft <laughs> the, the quickest? Uh, yeah. But no, yeah, you're totally right. It's a small percentage in comparison to the current um, largest stockholder. So uh, I think it'll be interesting to see over time if Sony or and or Tencent continues to up their stake and uh, kind of makes acquisitions a little bit more feasible um on that front yeah and if if they need to generate capital that it will be the quickest way to do it is slowly bleed away shares but that is of course when you get to the scary part but as long as they hold 51 percent, they have nothing to sweat about uh 10 cent will definitely be number one caller i imagine if uh capital is ever an issue unfortunately right now this is the last part of rapid fire we didn't have a long one this week uh which is uncommon for us but i wanted to quickly pick your mind about something that uh just frankly just confused me um and maybe yeah. you'll disagree with me on some things i don't know actually your stance on these things but last was part one had reviews go live uh as recently as this morning and yesterday and some interesting thing, uh, stuff came out there's a bunch of different reviews from all over the place there's a couple things you guys can go listen to or watch if you want to see some individuals talk about it but i wanted to kind of bring in the scope of everything and bring in metacritic and kind of just make fun of review scores, because I love doing that. So, an uh, interesting thing that came up. Metacritic for Last of Us Part 1, as of right now, and still as of recording, is, is sitting at an 89. For reference, the Metacritic for The Last of Us Remastered 
is at a 95. Dan, did you think that was quite interesting to see pan out? Uh, this is why I don't review things with a number, and I most likely never will. Uh, because uh, numbers are dumb, and you get things like this where it's like, what does that even mean to someone? With someone right. who have no knowledge of video games, and they look at these two numbers. How does Last of Us Remastered score higher than a part one remake, right? Absolutely. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. And obviously, you know, games are obviously of their time as well. Like, they're products of their time. So, uh, Last of Us Remastered in 2014 is very different than Last of Us Remastered in 2022. Like, mm. obviously, that's an eight-year gap there. So, not to, like, you know, talk crap about the Metacritic for Remastered, but the fact that Part 1 is only an 89 is really troubling to me because... Like, it's essentially the same game, just better. Like, it's it's widely being talked about as the definitive way to play The Last of Us Part 1. So, like, yes, I totally get that. Like, why is this such a lower score? I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if people, reviewers are factoring in the whole price issue with, with the game. You know, people discussing the value. Is this worth $70 if you've already paid $60 for it on PS3 and then $70? Uh, or I'm sorry, $60 on PS4 as well, or the upgrade actually I think was $40 if you owned the first game. Um, but it, it is interesting. Like we we talked about it on the podcast this week as well. Like the, we think that it, it it should be something like Sony should give people some kind of discount for having that heritage and buying the previous versions of the game. And maybe the reviewers are factoring that in. I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, it, it is interesting and puzzling. I, I agree with you, Elijah. Yeah, I, I stared at it for a while and I actually tweeted about it a little bit just Saying like I, I, this is why I just don't like this. It, this doesn't make any sense. Like, it, yeah. for someone that plays the game, and I just don't understand how it's not, frankly, a ten. I, I don't really get it. I don't. I don't know. But I can't wait to play it. I have it purchased, waiting on the download, uh, hitting at midnight tonight. I'll probably play like an hour or so. But uh, it was truly puzzling. I just was. I was like, I don't know how someone can just play this and be like, oh yeah, no, this is uh I've seen eights. I saw someone give it a two, I think, or something. I don't even know where you come from from that stuff. But hey, yeah. I just wanted to quickly bring it up. I, we don't need to talk too much about it. But I was just, <laughs> it's a bit interesting to say the least, I guess you could say. I don't understand how you could give that game a two. That's no, insane. I, I don't get it either. But yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. Let's move on. Now, I start the show with a single question to my co host, and this is no different. Dan, what yes. have you been playing? Well, uh, I actually, uh, with the podcast co-hosts, I've been playing Halo 2. Uh, we've oh. been kind of getting them through the Halo series. Christian uh, had mentioned he wanted to do it. So Gage was playing with Christian, and then uh, I was playing with Ro on Halo 2 co-op because it's two-player co-op. So we got through the campaigns uh, both together, and now we're anticipating... Well, I guess I'll, I'll save that for your other question, but uh, the other game I've been playing also is uh, Destiny 2 Witch Queen, which oh. I oh. played. Yeah, I played it at launch when it came out with Ro, and we played the legendary uh, version of the campaign, but we only yeah, got did. to like, yeah, <laughs> we only got to like Mission 6 or something. Oh, really? It, yeah, we we never finished it because Ro was really busy with school, and yeah. then I just kind of never went back to it. So I went back and I turned it to normal mode and I played solo by myself just so I could experience that story. And it was really great. I really love the game uh, or the expansion, I guess, to Destiny 2. Um, I was a huge Destiny 1 fan back in the day. So, uh, so that, uh, that answers my question. I was curious, what was your history with Destiny like? So, so you have been playing the game before. Absolutely, yes. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been like really invested in it, but yeah. like I always pick up the expansions and always play them. So, yeah, yeah. Destiny so Two. I, it, that, that I have a broken record on this podcast. I bring it up almost every week. I try not to bring it up. Sometimes I'm like, eh, you know, I'm playing Destiny. So, but um, yeah, yeah I've, I'm constantly playing Destiny. I actually gave it a break last season because it wasn't very good, but this season yeah, sure. is, is much better. I love, I love the uh, theming. I love. The new raid came back from Destiny One. King's Fall is very fun. I've completed that. It was. It's. I'm having. Wow. I'm having a blast. I, I love that. I think I've cleared it like five times already or something. Like 
it's oh it's gosh. really it's i love it i love it as soon as it came out like they upgraded certain things they made certain encounters faster so you don't have to like play it out to the f uh, fullest extent like you did in d1 for instance like the last encounter in d1 you couldn't actually damage the boss it was all mechanics based which for like the first couple experiences are really fun but when you're grinding out on your 10th run and you're like all right there's no way of making this faster it was a it was not as fun so i'm so glad they changed that there's other aspects that they changed throughout the i won't bore people but there's a couple other fights they changed that made it much more compelling and fun for instance the first um real encounter um you get points uh to open a door by killing things which is really cool so like that is you, cool. yeah so like if, as long as you kill stuff pretty fast you can get the encounter done faster so like it's almost like a little mini game inside of the game you're playing it's it's really fun and i enjoyed my time with with king's fall i'm actually going to do one probably tonight as well i i, I can't get enough of, of the rating once once the new guns come out and they're good i'm like all right well, the grind starts and it's so fun yes aside from that i went back to sifu very quickly um i jumped in and uh i i was like you know what i want to beat the game and i put it to easy because that that game is incredibly difficult incredibly difficult i actually hats off to everybody i i'm a big dark souls fan i've played them all i can't touch sifu i don't know what it is i don't know if i'm lacking something or if i'm playing it wrong but i i every time i touch the game i would just get annihilated before i would even see the boss i was on the third level i think and that's what was killing me and i was just like you know what Let's get this down to easy. I want to play the game. So I, I put it through the game. I blew through it because easy is like really easy, unfortunately, but it's fine. Uh, but I played it. had a good time. I loved Sifu. I'm I, I glad I went back. It's really fast when you have it on easy uh, because it is particularly easy and it's a pretty short game, but I liked it. It was, it was fun. It's a cool little uh, kung fu game uh, that I had a great time with. Um, aside from that, I think that's it. Pretty sure. Yeah. That's it. I'm going to go back to Escape Academy. Most likely with my wife I've been playing. That's been really good. Uh, we'll probably play that over the weekend. Aside from that, though, I'm pretty sure that's it. So let's start nice. Let's start the show. Rumor Roundup. This is more of a confirmation of a rumor that was revealed a while ago from several sources back in February. Jason Schreier revealed information on a game in the Assassin's Creed franchise codenamed Assassin's Creed Rift that will return to the roots for the franchise. And then back in August of uh, uh, August 19th, sorry, back in August 19th, Colin Moriarty of Last Day Media reported on the official name being Assassin's Creed Mirage. And today there were art leaks suggesting this to be true. And Ubisoft later confirmed the game is titled Assassin's Creed Mirage. And we'll learn more about it September 10th at the AC event they will be having. Reminder that this title was internally delayed following multiple delays inside of Ubisoft, original plan for late this year. It will now most likely launch early 2023. And of course, all of this was covered on the show prior. So that's more of an update than anything. Um, they said they will be returning to the roots. I'll be curious to see if that is true. I highly doubt we're getting like a Assassin's Creed 2 situation here. Um, I, I'm assuming there's no RPG elements. I just I want to see the game so I know what they mean. Because there's no way they're trying to do like an Assassin's Creed 2 now. I just don't think anyone there is interested in that. So what does that mean? Is it just mean like it's fully assassin related and like there's certain things you have to do? Is it much more linear? It is. It, there was reports that's going to be a lot smaller. Maybe that's the case. I don't know. Uh, are you Assassin's Creed fan, Ted? Did you make any of this? I am a huge Assassin's Creed fan. Yeah, you I are. actually have an Assassin's Creed wall back here. You yeah, can't you see are. it on my video, but yeah, you are. Uh, yeah, uh, we actually talked about the rumor of this yesterday uh, during the podcast, but then now to hear it confirmed from Ubisoft, the actual name of it, Assassin's Creed Mirage, is yeah. exciting. But yes, if if I'm excited if they go back to the uh, a traditional um, path of Assassin's Creed, like the mm. more stealth-based, like slow-paced approach, like blending in crowds, I actually like that kind of stuff. Me too, yeah. Uh, I like the RPG elements as well. Like I like that version. I like both versions of the game, but like we've been getting so many of those lately that I, I am excited to go back to this. And the prospect of the rumor being that they're going to reuse some of the assets from this game mm. to be an Assassin's Creed one remake from that. That's very exciting for me that's as really well. Cool. Because yes, I love Altair's character, especially in the later game, like Revelations when yeah. he meets up with Ezio. Yep. I, yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah, yeah. me too. I, I hopefully this um, I can't imagine it will be, but hopefully this is almost like a return to former or, or some sort of identity because I do feel like Assassins has had this kind of identity crisis. They don't really know where they are. 
I think right now, um, especially when you're talking about the story. Uh, I think I think they really just make it up as they go. So hopefully this is kind of a uh, a course correction for the franchise so we can have a more defined route uh, in the future. Absolutely. This next one is coming from Metro. And there seems to be plans to extend the hugely failed life service title Marvel's Avengers. According to a popular data miner and leaker for Avengers, Twitter user Miller, just as Miller, it's called Miller, says there is a deal behind the scenes with Embracer Marvel to extend the partnership to more games in the Marvel Universe. It does seem unclear, however, that if this means their games as a service title will continue or be sold to a halt. Here's a tweet, quote, from the inside looking in, it seems like Embrace are in the middle of working out a deal with Marvel that extends well beyond Avengers, which is understandable with recent news suggesting that both EA and Ubisoft have Marvel content in the pipeline. I suggest Avengers will live and that will be announced when the Embracer Marvel deal closes. Brass tax, the Crystal Dynamics acquisition has now officially happened and I'm hearing work continues on Avengers relatively unabated. Things can change. But that's where we send end quote Avengers launched to a lukewarm response to say the to say the least back in 2020 and how it has now seen small updates since launch, adding new characters and some small events throughout the year. Following the Embracer acquisition of Crystal Dynamics it is unclear where we stand with the game and any other titles in the near future. I can't imagine this is correct. I'll be honest. Um, I am not. Uh, he, of course, he might have a great source on this or he's just maybe speaking off the top. Of my head. I just can't imagine this is. This is true. I can't imagine Marvel looks at their lineup, looks at Embracer Group, and says, you know what? We're going to trust you with our characters. Here you go. Here, here. Make any game you want. I just don't, I don't see that happening, but I could be proven wrong. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, Marvel's Avengers has been one of the biggest failings, I think, of the Marvel games uh, recently. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd be surprised if, if Marvel's like, yeah, we trust you after you guys kind of butchered this launch uh, of a game that we were expecting high things out of with the Avengers um, name behind it. So uh, I guess the only other thing I could say is like money talks and mm, Embracer true. Group is a pretty big um corporation clearly willing to throw money around absolutely so who knows uh who knows if they end up throwing some big numbers to marvel maybe i i just can't imagine especially after the recent saints row they have recent news saying what's happening out of the uh those studios and now we'll have even more news when dead island comes if this is viable or not i just can't i can't i just can't be in the shoes of someone I up and being like, you know what? Yeah, let's sign off on Embracer Group and give yeah. it to who? I mean, really, at the end of the day, who are they going to? They don't have really anyone crazy. Uh, they could pull from their Square Enix team that they just got, but I imagine they have projects they're currently working on unless they completely abandon, which is possible. But I just, who who are they going to make a deal with and be like, who's going to develop it? Like, I can't picture someone that's like really up to snuff to really give to a Marvel game, but. I will say it seems that they're throwing around the Marvel name quite a bit. I mean, we're seeing so many games uh, and Star Wars titles, which, of course, is this, kind of the same publisher uh, coming from Disney, of course. But I, I, may, you know, maybe they just don't care. And then, like you said, maybe money talks. So maybe it won't matter. You know what's interesting? Like, I think, is it Square, Square Enix Montreal yeah. that made Guardians Montreal. of the Galaxy? Yeah. Yep, uh, Idos, my or, yeah, Idos. Yes, mm -hmm. you're right. Uh, so they bought them as well. So like, yeah. I, I would love to see a sequel to that game. That game was fantastic. I love the writing in that game. So maybe that helps that franchise out. Agreed. I, I maybe that would be the one thing I'd hope out of this. But yeah. again, I, I just Embracer, and, and like, who are you even talking to at Embracer? Because it's like. Yeah, we'll let one of your hundred plus studios work on it, but like who you know now you don't even know. So maybe right. they'll have a more focused agreement. Like yeah, so you can work on this as long as I don't know. But but w this is a thing. What time will tell? I guess. Absolutely. VGC is the next spot as we're discussing some rumors surrounding the Zelda collection that was leaked by Jeff Grubb sometime earlier this year. According to Jeff Grubb and Mike uh, Miotti, again, actually, we seem to be getting a Nintendo Direct showing the ports of Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, saying as far as, quote, 100%, there's a Nintendo Direct in September. It's that simple. There's still some uncertainty about whether this will be a general Direct, maybe a mini. There was some talk about being a partner Direct, end quote. 
They go on to discuss another potential remaster quote. The Metroid Prime thing seems to seems like it should be happening. It's a lot of remasters to announce on one thing, but maybe it'll be a little bit of the theme he, they, here. End quote. Uh, we reported on this, I want to say, like in May or maybe March time. I don't remember. Jeff Grubb kind of uh, spilled the beans on the Zelda thing. And uh, this is further confirmation it's coming. Uh, if it was anyone else, I would say this is probably untrue, but it's Jeff Grubb reiterating the same thing. So I, I'm almost guaranteed this is going to happen. Uh, so get excited about Wind Waker and Triad Princess, I guess. Although I, I, I'm not a huge fan of those games. Maybe I'll get them to try them out. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe Wind Waker I will, just from what Ro has said about it. He loves Wind Waker. Uh, yeah. But... Yeah, I, I don't. I've literally played three Zelda games in my entire life, and the, these are ne neither of the th or none of the three. So I don't know. I played uh, Link to the Past, Link Between Worlds, and uh, the new one, uh, Breath of the Wild. Loved Breath all those. Wild. Those are all great. Um, yeah. So I just want to play those again, to be honest. <laughs> a Yakuza Like a Dragon sequel could be reviewed soon. Push Square reports developer RGG Studios is teasing, quote, a sneak peek trailer, end quote. For something at its broadcast on September 8th, the stream is 8 p.m. Japan time, so it's going to be around 7 a.m. Eastern or 4 a.m. Pacific our time. The next Yakuza game is coming since some off-stream footage has turned up uh, reportedly. So apparently there has been someone kind of recording something offside, and it's clearly Yakuza, so something Yakuza will be here. It's unclear if it will literally be like a dragon or not. We'll have to see. That's going to be rumor around it for the week, so let's get into the actual show. Phil Spencer, head of Xbox and CEO of Microsoft Gaming, came out today for, I'm sure, no particular reason, especially not that the UK's Competition and Markets Authority recently came out and said, quote, they're concerned that Microsoft's anticipated purchase of Activision Blizzard could substantially lessen competition in gaming consoles, multi-gaming, subscription services, and cloud gaming services, end quote. It is. Now let's get with what Phil said, quote, while we love consoles, we recognize they're not the only way that people play games. Today, the largest and fast and growing segment of gaming is mobile platforms. To reach the billions of players where they are in no matter what device they play on, we need to embrace choice, giving players choice. And I want everyone to remember the word choice. Giving players choice in how they play their games makes gaming more accessible and leads to a larger, more vibrant communities of players. Choice is equally important to developers. Developers benefit from having a diversity of distribution and business models of their games choice unlocks opportunities for innovation and enables the industry to grow we're expanding choice in two ways through the, through the creation of game pass which make which gives players a subscription option and by bringing more games to mobile platforms including through our cloud gaming cloud game streaming technology subscription services like game pass make gaming more affordable and help players from all over the world find their next favorite game Game Pass empowers developers to bring more games to more players, not fewer. We intend to make Activision Blizzard's much-loved library of games, including Overwatch, Diablo, and Call of Duty, available in Game Pass and to grow those communities by developing even more value to players. We hope to continue growing Game Pass, extending its appeal to mobile phones and connected devices. We're expanding choice in two ways. There's choice again, by the way. Through the creation of Game Pass, which gives players a subscription option by bringing more games to mobile platforms, including through our ga uh, cloud gaming technology. So subscription services like Game Pass make gaming more affordable and help players from all over the world find their next favorite game. Game Pass empowers developers to bring more games to more players, not fewer. We intend to make Activision's Blizzard much-loved library of games, including Overwatch, Diablo, and Call of Duty, available in Game Pass and to grow those gaming communities. I'm going to stop right there for a second. So this is another reiteration of them stating all of our stuff is coming to Game Pass. I think we've all found that pretty clear, right? And I wanted everyone to remember choice for one particular reason. How many did, how many times did I just say choice? How many times did I just say choice in this statement? This is clear that he is very, 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 very much trying to make sure that choice is here. And maybe subconsciously, who knows? I'm sure this was looked over by maybe almost 100 people, including lawyers and all that. Uh, PR, all these things. Uh, and they clearly wanted choice there to make sure that 
nothing is being lost they're trying to make it clear like no us buying them is going to expand you saw how many times i said expand choice give player options uh, you know option choice game all open words to make sure nothing feels enclosed when they buy this oh that's so bad oh no we won't do that it'll give you more options uk uh, commission uh let's go back to this by delivering even more value to players we can we hope to continue growing game pass extending its appeal to mobile phones and any connected device in doing so we will pr uh, pursue a principled path we've heard that this deal might take franchises like call of duty away from the places where people currently play them that's why as we said before we are committed to making the same version of call of duty available on playstation on the same day the game launches elsewhere we will continue to enable uh continue to enable people to play with each other across platforms and across devices we know players benefit from this approach because we've done it with minecraft with continues to be available on multiple platforms and it has extend expanded to even more since Mojang joined Microsoft in 2014. As we extend our gaming storefront across new devices and platforms, we make sure we do so in a manner that protects the abilities of developers to choose how to distribute their games. We will continue to engage with regulators with a spirit of transparency and openness as they review this acquisition. With respect and welcome the hard questions that are being asked, the game industry today is robust and dynamic. Industry leaders include Ted Sen and Sony, gross continue to expand their deep and extensive libraries of games as well as other in entertainment brands and franchises which are enjoyed by players everywhere we believe that a thorough review will show that the combination of microsoft and activision blizzard will benefit the industry and players end quote now that was long but it was important to give you full context on this entire thing i think because it gives us an interesting thing how he's clearly trying to I mean, maybe manipulate is a strong word, but he's definitely trying to steer the conversation into a very, like I said, open. Uh, us buying them is good for everyone. Oh, you, we are spending. It almost sounds like, uh, Dad, correct me if I'm wrong here. It almost sounds like they're like, we're going to spend $70 billion to make everyone's lives better with Activision Blizzard's game. It almost comes off uh, with that note of how flowery this is. Um, did you read up on this uh, by chance, Dan? Uh, because I. I have to be frank here. Um, I'm a huge Xbox fan, but this this reading this, I was like, geez, I know you have to do stuff like this, but my God, so oh, this, yeah. does this sound just like kind of pandering all over the place? But of course, that's <laughs> what he has to do. Uh, right. It, as reference, they are entering a probe into the uh, acquisition purchase in the UK to further look into this. This is another kind of procedural thing that's coming uh uh, from this thing i don't think it i don't think anyone's relatively worried about this but it is important to note that these things are happening yeah absolutely i i, I think you said it best like uh this is very much pr speak that it phil's giving here in this statement uh, obviously choice being emphasized many many choice, times choice the, yeah, choice yeah choice. i i think it's definitely interesting and like if this were if this acquisition were happening in a time where Activision wasn't in a, a great deal of turmoil, I feel like this may get more scrutiny from me. But in the time of where Activision is just in a complete dysfunctional mess right now because of the CEO from the top down just creating an absolutely toxic environment. I am very, very hopeful that this goes through just for the employees of Activision Blizzard because I feel like if Microsoft doesn't step in and do something, I don't think that anything's going to happen for the positive for Activision Blizzard employees because as we've seen time and time again, like Bobby Kotick at the top continues to be there and nobody seems to care that this man that doesn't care about his employees is still at the top so it's like yeah i yeah i'm i'm hoping that this goes through and meaningful changes are made there and uh obviously this this you know statement and uh letter essentially they're writing here is trying to pander towards that um so i don't know it's it's getting pretty interesting yeah yeah and i i think we're actually getting pretty close to this being over um, yeah. I think I won't be shocked if this is over by May. Um, so I I read all of this and just went, wow, yeah, this is this is to circle quickly back to the Activision thing. Yeah, I I, I respect your uh, uh, outlook on um, getting the employees a better space. I think that's clear that that is one upside about this whole thing. I upside. Um, well, there's a few, I guess. There's a few upsides. There's a few upsides. There's one them, of course, buying them 
does probably make a better environment for everyone involved. Uh, we'll talk about how Xbox um, manages studios later, and that's up for grabs on if they're good or not at it. Uh, and then two, of course, them buying Activision Blizzard is someone else not buying them, uh, Tencent or some random conglomerate that doesn't know what they're doing, Embracer Group. Um, but aside from that, yeah, I, I read this. I, I don't think I have too, too much to bring on about. He wanted to reemphasize we're not taking any games away. He named the big three. That's pretty much the big three, as long as you're not talking about <laughs> Candy Crush from King, uh, yeah. which I, I guess... I, that's a completely different thing because that's a mobile game, but still, it, it was important to bring up. That is uh, one of them up uh, up there as well. But yeah, he wanted to make sure Call of Duty, Diablo, you know, that's going to stay on everything, but it will be on Game Pass, but it's not going to go anywhere. So it's clear that he wanted to make that as clear as possible. Like, you know, hey, this is happening, but, you know, it's going to still be everywhere. And, and like you said, and uh, like I'm sure everyone is telling themselves at home is like, yeah, it's clear that he wants a certain thing to happen after someone reading this uh, because he says it 70 times in this. Uh, but I don't have too, too much else. Honestly, I'm, I'm excited for this to be over so we can stop talking about it. I've been talking about this for a year and a half, so I'd be very excited for when it's done. Absolutely. Next up, uh, this is just a, this is just sad. It's all sad. So just get ready for this. All right, I'm I'm gonna be upset. Get ready for it. Three four three Industries behind Halo Infinite have come out and revealed their roadmap, and it leaves much to be desired. November eighth sees the launch of a long-awaited modes of both co uh, campaign co-op and mission replay. We will get back to co-op in a second, as they also announced Forge, which uh, will also be launching that day, although in beta form. Co-op has some bad news around it, though. 343 will be abandoning plans to release a local co-op option for the game and will only be launching an online co-op feature. Now let's get back to the roadmap. From November 8th, March 7th, we will be getting an aforementioned uh, Forge beta and campaign co-op and mission replay 30-tier battle pass, uh, which I guess is to give people something to do in the extended period they're going to find themselves in. And two new maps followed by a new game mode called Covert One Flag. I actually don't know what that is. And two events in December and January. The new season launches March 7th and lasts until June 27th. Featuring a new weapon, new maps, forge updates, narrative events, two new game modes, VIP and Escalation, new factor event and more. This of course makes the current season of the game the longest following this delay, making it over 10 months long. So, I wanted to bring this up, um... And I said it made me sad for multiple reasons. One, I still can't believe this is still in the state it is. Uh, it's clear that something is going on at 343. Um, I think it, I think if this were any other studio under any other publisher, they would have probably been fired by now. Uh, this is kind of crazy that we're, they had to delay basically again after having delayed Forge and co-op again, and they had to slice a thing off of campaign, which is split screen multiplayer. I'm not going to pretend like that's a feature I wanted or even cared about, but this that was something that they technically promised. Uh, I want to say in like 2016 when they were talking about this game um, in like hypotheticals, uh, and then they just weren't weren't uh, able to deliver. I don't know if you were a Halo Infinite fan, damn, but um. My God, uh, I, I don't even know what to say anymore. It's 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 probably the biggest disappointment in gaming generation for me so far uh, for since the wow. Series X and stuff came out. Yeah, because this was this is Halo. This is incredibly important. If you don't know if uh, Halo is important, achievers uh, listening, uh, go watch um, uh, the Power On documentary. Uh, it's an incredible documentary. Yeah, nice. I didn't even see that. Of course you like Halo. Jesus. But go watch the Power On documentary if you... um. If you uh, question if this is a very important game or not, this should have been showed respect, and clearly, it has not been. Go ahead, Dan. So, my thoughts differ a little bit. So, mm. Gage, Gage, and I seem to always go back and forth about this, and my, I think that partially there is some kind of issue at three four three in terms of management. I think there is something going on where there's too many hands in the basket or something at a high level that they're not keeping the team focused on what they should be working on or you know focused on whatever you know maps or whatever whatever the the case may be within three four three. I think there's a small some kind of issue there. I don't know what kind of issue. Obviously, we're just speculating. But also, I think the other problem is this game should have been delayed a second time. I know that this game got delayed a year. A year. However, 
Yes, absolutely. I, I, I definitely hear you there. However, I will say there was a lot of rumors and speculation online, especially recently from all of the uh, leaked footage we've gotten from Halo Infinite's multiplayer from 2020, which was right before they showed off their campaign for the first time. The multiplayer at that time was a hero-based shooter that doesn't resemble yeah. what the game ended up coming out to be. So, like, they essentially had to completely scrap that and start over. And the rumors also are that Chris Lee, who was the head of 343 at that time, was kind of leading that charge. And so you step back and you're like, man, it's 2020. It's been five years since Halo 5 came out. And we have this thing that Halo fans probably aren't going to be happy about. And somebody made the decision to say, Chris Lee, you need to get thrown away somewhere else. And they brought in Joe Staten for the campaign portion of Halo Infinite. They brought in the guy who led flighting for Master Chief Collection for the multiplayer portion. But that was just in 2020. So like less than two years ago, they were brought into those roles. I don't know if that's enough time for them to get themselves course corrected back to where they need to be. So like... Personally, I think that time will tell if that is the case, if 343 is having a, a bigger issue. I think that what happened was the game was completely changed. They had to completely scrap a lot of stuff, and they started over development. Whoever's fault that was is kind of irrelevant in my eyes. And that's kind of caused us to be at the point where 343 is has to, having to make systemic changes to the actual core game in order to get it to the place where it should have been at the get-go. So, like, they're pretty much playing, uh, playing catch-up at this point in order to get back to where we should be so that we can continuously get seasonal content. And, yeah, it's not great. Uh, obviously, the 10-month... Uh, cycle for this season is not and not great news at all so uh i'm just hopeful that after season three finally comes next year they get into a cadence and things will go to normal but is it too late at that point i don't know Live service games is always an interesting thing, right? Is it ever too late to like be good i would argue no because it's free to play maybe i don't know but I wanted to quickly come back to something you said where I find that it's clear no one wants to say whose fault it is, but someone is at fault for this. Someone at 343, right. maybe it was a higher up that's ahead of their studios. Who knows? But but that that's what I want. I was like, what happened? Like that's that's I really want to know like what happened. Was the team just bleeding talent like it clearly was? I want to say in 2020. They lost, uh, I mean, they lost a lot of people, but they, they were losing, like, uh, some story directors. They lost, like, some design directors. There's clearly a mess there. We were getting reports that uh, everyone that works there is basically contractors. So, like, there's not a stable work environment with people, like, and people keep cycling in and out. I don't know, but that's all I want to know at this point. What happened? Because it's still, they're still not at where they need to be. They had to delay, in theory, in theory, they had to delay co-op for their game two years. Because, like, they were going to come out when the games launched. Halo Master Chief was on the box. Clearly, it was meant to be a launch game, and they let them delay it. So they came out last year, still didn't have it. And then this year, they're finally going to have it with, with Forge. So they had to delay two of arguably the most important features of Halo. Co-op and, and Forge, which is the backbone of why Halo 3 was so revolutionary for its time is they had their whole forge and they had like I blanking on what it was called like Bungie picks where like Bungie would Bungie go and favorites. but thank you Bungie favorites where they'd go yep. and pick out their favorite games or maps or, or you know all that stuff and for that to happen it's just it's it's puzzling and I I keep bringing it up because I I, I just want to know what's, what happened like this season's now 10 months long in that span of time uh bungie almost releases an expansion for an entire game <laughs> they go through three seasons or something in that time frame almost like we're working at Which, like two different levels 
Which, to be fair, Bungie is a- astronomically bigger company than 343 is. Now, That's currently. under Microsoft? I would argue that is not fair. Well, no, 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 no. I'm saying currently. I'm saying currently. Oh, you're speaking Bungie. specifically with staff count? Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. Um. Yeah, yeah I, I believe you are correct with that. But again, it, it, I uh, let me back up. I do agree with you. Yeah, staff count, I believe Bungie is... I think is almost a double because uh, last time I counted Halo Infinite uh, three for three staff, they were at like high mid hundreds or something. I can't rem- I, I faintly I really can't remember. It's, it's very confusing to figure it out, too, because it's con- half of them are contracting probably. So it's very unclear how many people work there through. Let's see if I can get it real quick. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyways, is uh, uh, I do think that is pretty fair to bring up, although. One one is under the wing of uh, ooh, uh almost hundred billion dollar company at this point, and the and the other one is by themselves. Prior to the, of course, they're bought by Sony now, um, and they were getting funding on other ways. But it, important to know, one was under Microsoft, whereas the other one left Activision, made their own thing, was able to bring in everything inside until they were uh, purchased by uh, PlayStation. I just think it's it's still puzzling. It, it's still puzzling. I don't know. But like I said, hopefully, uh, and I uh, tweeted about this today, hopefully there is a happy ending to this at some point. I don't know. Maybe there'll be an expansion. Yeah. Uh, hopefully one day I'll be able to say Halo Infinite's good now, and, uh, and we'll, all, we'll all be excited. No, to be fair, the gameplay is good. So, it is. Like, it is. It's yes. just, it's not, it's not, but it's, it's not Halo yet. It's still missing like a lot of stuff. I, the the I loved um the multiplayer when it came out, but it's just they had the same modes and the same maps the entire time I played of like what was I playing like three months or something I forget it was like three or four months and nothing had changed about the game we didn't get a new mode new weapons new maps or nothing so it's a terrible games as a service game especially compared to what uh things now where it's just it had no rotation it had no modes I remember I was excited when they added a the ability to just play Slayer. Like, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I get to play just Slayer now. Whereas it was uh, originally, uh, oh my God, I'm already blanking. But wasn't it like, uh, quick play. it was, yeah, quick play and then private yeah. matches and then a uh, big team battle. And that was literally it, which is like, what the fuck? And, oh, and then they had um, Fiesta when they, when they did their first kind of event thing. I don't know. Let's hope, like I said, let's, I, I, I hope uh, in a year or so I'll be able to be like, oh my god, I'm so glad they, they fixed it or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Moving on. Reported by VentureBeat, NetEase, a Chinese gaming and internet company, is going to be acquiring Detroit Become Human developer Quantic Dream. The amount wasn't disclosed, but the, uh, this will make Net, uh, NetEase's first European studio, as Quantic Dream is based in Paris, France. Quantic Dream, founded in 1997 by David Cage, would go on to de- develop several narrative-focused games, 1999's The Nomad Soul, their first game, and 2005's Fahrenheit, but wouldn't become a well-known name in the industry until their critically praised 2010 game Heavy Rain, which, uh, which was then followed by a much softer launch of Beyond Two Souls, which I believe was 2013. I can't remember, though. And then in 2018 came Detroit Become Human. The current game Star Wars Eclipse has been announced, although it has seen much trouble in hiring after many reports of a hostile work environment and David Cage being a well-known dick, for lack of a better word. I found this interesting. So we saw, we've, we see Nighties acquire a pretty big name in Quantic Dreams. Apparently, they were also having trouble getting talent. Uh, to be fair, everyone in the industry is having trouble with talent, but I imagine that theirs was uh, a lot worse, given the circumstances, with a lot of the things they actually were, like, were sued by someone. Then they tried to like sue like a couple news outlets for saying stuff. It, it's a big mess. But uh, Quantic Dream has now been acquired by NetEase, a Chinese company. I'm curious if uh, what this will, if anything, will change about everything about their stuff. Will this change how they hire? I imagine NetEase seems like a company that doesn't necessarily care. They seem to be pretty lax. So I don't think this is the uh uh harbinger of change necessarily but i don't know what do you what do you think about these news dan honestly uh it's 
not really a situation that I, I feel like is going to get any better with Nettie's, mm. uh, especially if David Cage doesn't, you know, move on after being they were acquired because of, you know, there's ma many issues that have been, you know, pulled out of the the well for this studio that it's not a good work environment at all. And uh, I I do worry about uh, Net Nettie's having a uh not so heavy hand in their uh day-to-day -day operations and kind of just you know hey you guys make these great you know narrative focused games why don't you just keep making keep those? doing we that don't care. yeah we don't care what's happening they're just you know keep making them I as an uh, as a as a reminder to uh to the achievers out there um they're technically i believe still in pre-pro for um uh eclipse they actually might have moved on to production by now uh because that was a few months ago but they were having huge troubles getting people to staff this game so i imagine this helps a lot in multiple areas they'll have uh the capital to bring people on uh because they might have just been outbid uh everyone is having trouble uh, hiring on you're gonna see very inflated wages because they need to one keep people and to incentivize new talent and i think that was and that might have been the precipice behind this entire purchase to begin with. Maybe, uh, maybe the uh, the founder David Cage, and I believe he had a he had a CEO as well. So maybe his board just walked around or like anyone looking to buy, and, and maybe maybe that's what happened. I don't know, but uh, none of it was disclosed. So everything will be just to our heads. I I will be curious to see what a Star Wars Eclipse will be. Uh, what is it? Just Detroit become human in Star Wars? I don't know. It doesn't seem like it will be with the trailer, but. You know, trailers could mean anything. I think someone associated with Quantic Dream also said that Eclipse was at best coming like 2025 or 2026. Yeah. And I'm like, that sounds right, actually. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. Yeah, someone came out and was like, they haven't even started the game, <laughs> which yeah. is like, wow, that that means they are in for bad. I'm very curious why they even announced it. Maybe it was to get people to try and apply and be like, hey, we're working on a Star Wars game. Please, for the love of God, someone come help. And it just, yeah. it looked like it, it either didn't work or maybe it did. And that's, that uh, got Nezzy's attention. Who knows? Sony. Let's go back to them. Sony has made another move acquiring a studio. This time it is a mobile game developer named Savage Game Studios. Another no financials were disclosed type of moment here. But it is clear Sony wanted to grab a promising mobile studio. Since the studio was only founded back in 2020 and has yet to release a title, but they have said they are working on a new unannounced AAA mobile live service action game, whatever that means. Let's get into some of the background of the studio. Uh, Mikhail Katkoff is the CEO and co-founder. He has some experience in the mobile space working on several branches of projects. He was an executive producer on Angry Birds Rio back in 2013. He was the game economy designer on The Cruise back in 2013. Uh, a product management on Angry Birds Star Wars in 2012. I could not find any credits on Najim Ajar. Uh, I was using Mobu, Moby Games, so she just might not have been listed. Uh, so, sorry about that. I, but I could not find anything, and I even Googled her name and couldn't find anything either. So, apologies for that. And another co-founder in Michael McManus, co-founder of Victory Lab Games from 2017 to 2020, and a techno director for Wargaming 2019 to 2020. Now that we've covered some of the people in the studio, let's hear about what their CEO had about the acquisition. Quote, established in 2020 and led by myself and fellow co-founders Najim Adjar and Michael McManus, Savage Game Studios, born of our many years of mobile game development experience spanning a number of massively successful global IP, our guiding vision was a creative space where experimentation and taking risks were weren't warily avoided, but rather eagerly embraced. We've all worked at big studios, and while we expect the advantages of ample resources, one day they spawn nibble and we could call our own shots. So why then, you may be thinking to yourself, would you join PlayStation Studios? We made this deal because we believe that PlayStation Studios leadership respects our vision for how we can best operate and succeed. And because they, too, are not afraid to take chances. All of that, plus the ability to potentially tap into PlayStation's amazing catalog of IP, and the fact that we will benefit from the kind of support that only they can provide. The harder question to answer would be, why not? On behalf of everybody at Savage Game Studios, thank you for having us. We can't wait to show you what we've been working on. This is, of course, is via the PlayStation blog. Let's hear from Herman Host. When talking about this on the PlayStation blog, he wanted to ensure that this acquisition is additive to their ecosystem and won't take away from what we know PlayStation is now, stating, quote, As we assured you before with our plans to bring select titles to PC, our efforts beyond console is in no way diminish our commitment to the PlayStation community, nor our passion to keep amazing single-player narrative-driven experiences 
It's been a tremendous year for games on PS5 and PS4, with huge releases including Horizon Forbidden West, Grand Turismo 7, Elm Be the Show 22, and on November 9th, the highly anticipated God of War Ragnarok. Plus, uh, PlayStation VR 2 is also on the horizon, promises huge leap forward and presence and immersion, bolstered by best in class software like Horizon Call of the Mountain. We're proud of our releases on PC as well, with Marvel Spider Man Remastered and the upcoming Uncharted Legacy of Thieves collection, giving gamers without PlayStation hardware a taste of our amazing library of first party titles. Our mobile gaming efforts will be similarly additive, providing more ways of uh, for more people to engage with our content and striving to reach new audiences unfamiliar with PlayStation and our games. Service Game Studios joining a newly created PlayStation Studios mobile division, which will operate independently from our console development and focus on innovative on the go experiences based on new and existing PlayStation IP. End quote. Another very cheery thing that it's like, oh, we bought something and it's going to be so nice for everyone involved. Yay! Um, I think this is clear that they continue to want to diversify. I don't think this is a. Uh, I, one thing I was not is surprised when I read this, which is un, uh, unlike me. I, I, I've been surprised about their movies and things of that nature. When I read this, I was like, you know what? Yeah, it makes sense. You're in- incredibly furiously entering the PC market. You are clearly super in, uh, intrigued into making movies because you have, I think now, seven of them in development. And then you now have an opening in the mobile market. And of course, you started VR. Uh, really before it was like super popular yeah and uh that's really all i have to say i don't have too much to add here it's it's very interesting that they picked them it seems like they clearly wanted someone new they were like oh you guys look great what are you guys working on they probably demoed whatever whatever a triple a mobile game looks like i don't know what that is but hey more power to you people but uh clearly they were um impressed because they bought them on the spot like they have with a couple other studios recently too Absolutely. I think uh, also, like, just to add into that, Microsoft's up- upcoming acquisition of Activision may have played a, pa- a factor as well, because, of course, Activision owns King, yep. which is one of the largest mobile developers out there. So maybe they're trying to make sure they can compete on the mobile market, looking at uh, Microsoft going after them. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty biased when it comes to mobile. I think it's just a terrible place to try and sell things, although I do uh, respect them. I think... Um, they said an interesting thing at the end when uh, their CEO of Savage Games was saying, like, this is exciting so we can implement PlayStation IP potentially in their game. They would not have just let him say that. So clearly that is probably the motivational factor behind this. Hey, let's get, I don't know, let's get Ratchet and Clank on the mobile devices. All right, well, we need someone to get that. Boom, let's buy them, right? We saw Nix's work get to work pretty fast, right? As soon as they were purchased, they are like, all right, make Spider-Man Remastered. All right, you did that. And clearly, this is probably a similar situation. Hey, we have a mobile thing. Guess what you're going to be working on? A bunch of our IP in mobile games. Go. And that's uh, what I imagine them, what they're for. I'll be curious to see if this is profitable because it's just the mobile game. The mobile. I, I'm so turned off on mobile games. I don't even play games on my phone. I have ever. I've never. I haven't played. I don't even remember the last game I played. I think I played um Lost Phone or, or someone's Lost Phone or something like that. Um, what the heck is that? Yeah, yeah, it's actually a pretty good game. It was um, uh, it's it, so you, I, I think it's called a lost phone, and when you play it, it is someone's phone. So you pretend like your phone was lost and you found someone's phone, and the mystery is figuring out whose phone it is. So like mm. you'll all right. Oh, um, I need to get down to the internet to like figure out who this is. Okay, what's their Wi-Fi password? Ooh, I don't know. Let's check their notes. Uh, their notes said they. Uh, yeah, they write down their password. Is password corrected? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, and then like the thing is like, what's my favorite flower? Oh, let's go there are photos. It's stuff like that. Or like it's a it's a puzzle game. You figure out it's a very it was actually a very pretty story. Uh, it ended very nicely, very very similar to Gone Home in some aspects. But because you think it goes one way, it goes completely a different direction. But uh, that that that's probably the last time I played that. I think that was in like 2016 or something. So I'm biased against this. I I just do not like mobile games. Uh, uh, I tried to play. Oh, Disney Mirrorverse, and that was awful. Just terrible, Ter- terrible game. Do not play the game. I I went to start it. I did the tutorial. I was like, this is awful, and I just turned it off. So curious to uh to see what you <laughs> curious to see. Yeah, curious to see what you thought uh, what you thought about this news, uh, Dan. Yes. Uh. Yeah. That the mobile stuff yeah i think it's absolutely a product of the acquisition of microsoft um 
acquiring um, King. I was a part of the Activision deal. So, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, I hope we get some good mobile games and not some bad ones like <laughs> what you're, you're describing. So, it was, well, I mean, they're... I don't know. Mobile is a specific platform you got to develop for mobile. It's got to make sense on mobile. You can't just port yeah. Uncharted to mobile. No, so, no. Hopefully. God, please don't yeah. do that. Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, I, I mean, I'll be excited for whenever they make Uncharted run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be <laughs> running in Yeah. 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 Uh. Ben, uh, this was really cool. I wanted to quickly bring this up. This is via Benji Sales. I love the uh, other. There's a great Twitter follow. I'm going to see if I can get him on the show soon. Um, this is all of the Sony PlayStation video game studio acquisitions since 2019. Insomniac, Housemark, Nixes, Fire Sprite, Fabric Games, which is now Fire Sprite, um, Blue Point Games, Valkyrie Entertainment, Haven Studios, Bungie, Savage Game Studios. Aggressive, to say the least. 2019. So in three years, they have acquired one, two, three, four. Nine, nine studios. One, and one being actually go ahead. Pretty cheap too. Pretty cheap too. I Relatively, of yeah, especially yeah. when you compare it to Microsoft's seventy billion acquisition. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Insomniac was a steal at I believe three hundred million dollars or something. I still don't quite understand who was smoking crack to think that they could sell for three hundred million dollars. You could easily have sold double that. But hey, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Steam Deck. Let's talk about Steam Deck. Steam Deck designer Greg Coomer has some interesting things to say during an interview on the latest issue of Weekly. Uh, oh my god. I, I always uh, pronounce this incorrectly. Uh, Fatmitsu? Famitsu. There we go. Famitsu. Thank you. Weekly Famitsu. Blech. We celebrate that players in Asia can now reserve Steam Decks. When asking any of you, quote, if Steam Deck is successful, can we expect more in the future? End quote. He answered with the following, quote, Unless something major changes, there will be a next generation of Steam Deck projects in the future. The theme, size, and shape will change, and it might even become a streaming machine. Development on the Steam Deck will continue, end quote. The later on detailed improvements they would like to see, uh, stating battery being the number one issue on the table when speaking to Steam Deck developer Pierre Loup Griffoffs. <laughs> Griffoffs? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> quote, we're also constantly optimi optimizing the operating system to reduce battery consumption when playing games that are not too demanding. This will improve the battery life. In any case, battery issues are on the top of our list of future improvements. End quote. Wasn't too much there, but I do love that he is just straight up open and be like, yeah, 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 as long as nothing crazy happens, yeah, we'll make new ones. Uh, I love Steam. They do, not, they do seem very open uh, where in the gaming industry it's you ask this to anyone, you're going to get a very PR answer. If you ask Phil Spencer, will there be another X? Be like, if the future pans out correctly and games stay as they are, we would love to release a new <laughs> Xbox in the near future that will feature some of the best games. Like, it would just be this PR mess and where he is, sounds like a very human answer of like, yeah, yeah, as long as nothing crazy happens, I'd love to make more. So that I thought that was cool. I don't have a Steam Deck. I kind of wish I did, but at the same time, I don't because I feel like I wouldn't use it. But I don't know. Dan, did you have a Steam Deck and did any of this uh, sound cool? I do not have a Steam Deck. Uh, honestly, the most exciting thing to me about the Steam Deck is playing your PC games on the go on the actual platform. I don't personally see the value in streaming on a device like the Steam Deck because okay. you could do that on your phone anyways. Like people are, you know, Xbox, for instance, Xbox Cloud Streaming. You can do that, all of that stuff on your phone uh, without needing an additional piece of hardware. So... For me, it would be more exciting to see the next evolution of Steam Deck, get better battery life, all of that stuff. And yeah, I, I'd be interested maybe, but I'm not a huge PC gamer uh, myself. I, I like to play the console. So yeah, yeah same here. I, I, I associate the computer with work. So like, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not touching this thing to play video games unless I have to. Because like, to yep. me, like tapping on a keyboard, that just I feel like I'm working. I feel like I'm I'm doing stuff for the show or something. I like no, I gotta I have to leave this to be able to like enjoy myself. Like I'll go into the living room. Like that feels like play. This this like when I enter here, like mm -hmm. I, I wanna like work. I don't wanna like yeah. play games. So I'm I'm kind of the same way. I would love a Steam Deck literally for ROMs. And I will say that right now. That is the only reason. I would not play it for probably anything else. Not not a single other thing. I want it just for ROMs. <laughs> Cause it seems like uh it's pretty sick the way you can just kind of I think it's called emu deck or something. You just download it and you're just good and you just have everything wild stuff. So cool. 
Achievers, as it is kind of rare in the show, but I try to do it semi often because I don't want to skip on a, a news story just because I don't want to cover it the way you guys know I like to. So, um, Dan, to, to let you know, so you know, some uh, I like doing write ups, but I don't do write ups on things that I have to almost basically write exactly what they're saying. And this was an interview, and I also don't like doing write ups on interviews because it also takes it with a click. It's a great interview, so we're going to do two things like we always do, Achievers. I'm going to give you some highlights. I'm not going to cover the whole thing, and you're going to go over to IGN and give them a click for me, okay? So we're going over to IGN. This is by Ryan Dinsdale. Prey director says, Arcane was forced to use the title Prey. So I wanted to quickly go over some of this uh, because it, I thought it was fascinating, uh, and I want everyone to go and make sure uh, they read this. Now, this whole write-up was on a podcast, and it was first written on by Kutaku, but I, I found it on IGN. So let's uh, say this quote. Calling Prey, Prey. Oh, and this is by, sorry. This is by Prey director Rafael Colantion. And he was a developer at Arcane. Quote, calling Prey, Prey. That was very hurtful to me. I did not want to call this game Prey. And I had to say uh, I wanted to anyway in front of journalists. There is a bit of the artistic, the creative side that is insulted when you tell this artist, you know your game, it's going to be called Prey. And you go like, I don't think it should. I think it was a mistake. Uh, calling it Oh, did you hear that? No? What's that? No, you didn't. Okay, I thought you heard. There's a huge thunder uh, right outside my uh, oh. uh, window. And I was like, whoa, you might have heard that. That was like crazy oh. loud. Crazy oh, loud. Geez. No, it's, I'll be fine. Unless I'm not. And then uh, keep keep rolling. <laughs> calling, it, calling it play uh calling it prey was also detrimental to the game's sales um because fans of 2006 uh prey would protest arcane's games and those who disliked the original wouldn't look twice at it quote it was also a kick in the face to the original makers of prey i wanted to apologize to them many many times i didn't really have a chance because i don't really know those people it was never our intention to steal their ip and make it ours it's gross and that's not what i wanted to do end quote Clontanio left Arcane not long after Prey was released in 2007. Not shocking, since this is the... Uh, you, you clearly didn't want to do it, and they made you do it. I am shocked to hear that Bethesda forced this guy to use Prey as the word. Very shocked. I, I don't... I, I Clearly, they wanted to for the name. Um, But I guess there is... I, and I haven't played the original Prey, and I haven't played this Prey either. Although my father was very much like... This is just Bioshock, so play it. And I was like, all right, I'll play it now. Like, now that he said that, I was like, okay, you, he doesn't throw that word around lightly. I'm like, all right, I'll go play Prey now. So I'm going to play Prey soon. But I I can't believe he, and I love that he's so open about it too. I felt gross, and that's not what I wanted to do. Like, I love the openness about this. And again, I am shocked that Bethesda was like, no, you're calling this Prey. Because uh, 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 name recognition, I assume, is the only motivating factor, because there can't be really any other one. Um, I don't know. Did you catch this uh, 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 interview? Yeah, and that's kind of weird that they would say name recognition because like there was only one there other was game. one it's game, like, right? But like, like, can you think of another reason? Because I was trying to think to myself while while re uh, reading the interview, why yeah. would they make them say that? And I can't yeah. think of any other reason. So no, it has to be just because yeah. it's prey. It has to be, yeah. Uh, because uh, wasn't there a prey too, but they canceled it. So like maybe, yes. maybe they were like, there's also Mystique because the second Prey never released or something. I don't, I really don't know, but I love that he was so open about it. And, and frankly, I don't know who at Bethesda was like, no, it won't sell copies if it's not named Prey. I don't know who that guy was, but qu quite, quite surprising to me at least. Yeah. It, it, there was a Prey 2 under development uh, from Human Head. And yes. I think they were the original developers if i'm remembering right maybe not but uh yeah they were making the prey too and it's very different than what we got out of the prey game from arcane um and i've never played the original prey but uh very much i loved arcane's prey although you know i, I have no affinity to the the name prey so like uh, obviously the fans of the original were upset about it but uh I think it's very fascinating that they made them use a name for a game that has one other entry. It's like, couldn't you guys have just named this whatever? Like, as a quick um, as a quick research, first off, you were correct. It was Human Head who developed yeah. the original. It was ported by Venom Games to the 360 version. 
Um, gotcha. Maybe this is the reason. So this is the game's story. It's focused on Cherokee Damacy Tommy Tawadi. As he, his girlfriend, and grandfather are abducted aboard an alien spaceship known as the Sphere as it consumes material both inanimate and living from Earth in order to sustain itself. So maybe it's because it's space. And the, as far as I yeah. remember, although not completely the same, the aliens in this game like went into objects. So maybe that's yes. an, another thing. So I, but again, I, I was like flabbergasted when I was reading this story. I was like... <laughs> Who was there was like, no, if we don't name this prey, we're going to yeah. lose millions of sales. Like, I just can't. I can't imagine. Arguably, it might have done better if it wasn't uh, named prey. Who knows? But uh, we'll and never know that. You said, your, you said your dad said it was like Bioshock? But that, my, yeah, my father was playing. He was like, this is just Bioshock. I was like, all right, yeah, I'll it, play it. Never mind. All right, cool. He, he's spot on. It's yeah. exactly like it. I, I'm surprised it wasn't. Um, and. It would be um, probably in worse taste, but they could have said it, it was shock something. But I, I, I clearly that probably wasn't on the table um, uh, yeah. to, to, to say that. But that would have been even that would have probably been smarter thing to try and incorporate shock in the name in some way um, to kind of hint at people who's like, this is a lot like Bioshock, but we can't say that. Yeah. This is an update to a story we reported on about two weeks ago. P-Cube currently being accused of withholding money from a grant that was meant for an Indonesian developers that were working under them while they were publishing a title now seems to have been accused yet again by another studio in the form of developer Corsell, alleging that the publisher has not paid the entire minimum guarantee in the publishing agreement. Via Twitter, the studio says, quote, P-Cube has published... Oh, God... Eritinario Blade 2 on Nintendo Switch, PS4, and Xbox One in Europe since October 29th. Oh, you still there, buddy? Oh, oh yeah, okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Everything flickered. I was like, am I gone? Oh. <laughs> I'm praying power does not go out halfway through this because we're like kind of close to being done. So, like, I'm really hoping it just doesn't go boop and I'm just gone. You're, you're praying. Oh, he did. <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking so fun <laughs> a publishing agreement with us and agreed, and agreed to pay a minimum guarantee to us however pcube only paid a small part of that minimum guarantee on the signing milestone by the time we sent them the game and they never paid the remaining milestones end quote i also wanted to read a they have a long page on twitter i will not be reading all of it so if you want the full context go over to course twitter but i wanted to quickly read one part of it as well this is important context, and it's very clear, like, oh, this, this is probably true. P-Cube offered to hand over publishing control to us only if we agreed to keep this matter secret. But we no longer wanted to be involved in any more deals with P-Cube. Shocking. We knew something was not right, but as a small developer, we could not afford to pay legal fees to fight the case in another country. We have contacted each platform to ask for a return of our publishing control. So far, only Nintendo and Sony have taken our game off their Europe stores, and we still have not received any revenue from sales in Europe. Because of this incident, we had to do various additional works to recover from our financial uh, situation. We promised that we would be soon be back to patch the problems and continue to release new content for Adorino Blade 2. <laughs> we are always, uh, always thankful for everyone who has been supporting us whenever we have fun with the game, etc., etc. So, I don't know if you caught the previous story. Um, yes. You did. Yeah. So, wow. Um... Wow, is is everything I said? I I very openly said uh, uh on on the prior show, and I still feel this way. But you know, it's diminished quite significantly. But I I always say innocent until proven guilty is usually what I go around my life uh, uh proclaiming about. But we're now at three studios saying that you shorted them in some way. Oh, there's a, when there's smoke, there's fire. I want to say, and this is pretty compelling that PCube it, it, it may maybe no one should publish with them at least until this is all uh, uh, fixed out. And also, I said on the on the previous show, if this is untrue, it should be incredibly easy for PCube to prove it's not. Yeah, but they have it so clearly <laughs> it, it might be true. I don't know. What did you think about all this, Dan? Yeah, this is really, really gross. The things that P Cube's doing, uh, and yeah, like you're saying, it would be very easy for them to say, "No, this isn't true," and here's the fat, here's the proof. It's like mm, that ain't happening. So yeah, and also they were pretty quiet with this one. I could not find a statement 
Uh, that might be different as of recording now. Uh, let us know in the comments below, as always. But I couldn't find a statement. They were pretty quick to, to say about the other one. Now, this one, they haven't said anything. So they're like, ooh, the walls are closing in. <laughs> Um, yeah. and it is a shame that they, uh, and they were being very honest, like we couldn't afford to sue them. So like, we just fucking left and, and asked our games to be taken down. I don't blame them. Uh, the, suing a company is very expensive. So very few, uh, uh, lawyers will work pro bono on corporation, uh, 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 sues. Um, so I, I don't blame them, but yeah, this is, uh, this is very sad to hear. Uh, th these are three very small studios. The, neither of the studios involved in this were very big. So to them to be kind of picked on and, and belittled in this manner is very sad, to, to say the least. Uh, hopefully, and I, was, I said this uh, the previous week, hopefully justice is served uh, in this case. It's, I feel very bad for all the vet devs involved. Absolutely. That is the show for the week, Dan. Now we have date updates for you. Xbox will be making its digital return to Tokyo Game Show on September 15th. Expect to see updates on existing titles from Xbox Game Studios and titles launching from developer partners that we hope will detail players here in Japan, across Asia, and across the world. That was via Xbox Wire. So, cool. I don't... I, they were very clear. Uh, this was basically don't get excited. Uh, written out. So, yeah, let's not, let's not get our hopes up. I don't think uh, we will see really anything there. But we shall see. The PlayStation Plus games have been revealed. These are the monthly games and the game catalog lineup for September. Let's go with the monthly games for PS4. You're getting Need for Speed Heat and Grand Blue Fantasy Versus. And PS5, your title is Toem. Don't know what that is, but it looks very cool. You know what? I read the description of everything I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. I will read this. Set off on a delightful expedition and use your photographic eye to uncover mysteries in this hand-drawn adventure game. Chat with quirky characters, solve their problems by snapping neat photos, and make your way through a relaxing landscape. Interesting. I might try this. This looks kind of cute. I love the art style. It's very, uh... Minecraft meets Mario, almost, kind of? Like, that's kind of what I'm getting a vibe. It looks very fun. I, I, I kind of want to play this. It has a 10 out of 10 on Steam. Ring. Whoa! Okay, okay. I will definitely be trying yeah. this now. I did not yeah. know that. Okay. Um, let's go for the game catalog for the month. So uh, this is everything coming to extra and premium. I always want to make sure I get this right. And this uh, uh, this will be available September 20th. All right, here we go. Deathloop uh, will be a PS5 title. Assassin's Creed Origins, PS4. Watch Dogs 2, PS4. Dragon Ball Universe 2, PS4. Spirit Fair Farewell Edition, PS4. Chicory, A Colorful Tale, PS4. Monster Energy Supercross, the official video game 5, PS4 and PS5. Alex Kidd in Miracle World DX. I didn't know they made a remake of that game. PS4 and PS5. Rabbids Invasions, the interactive TV show, PS4. Um, Rayman Legends, PS4. Oh, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game complete edition, PS4. That's actually pretty cool. I might pick that up. Um, and here are your PS Plus Premium Classics. So if you're on Premium... Um, this is the only way to get these games. This is available September 20th. Siphon Filter 2, a PS1 game. Uh, play Siphon Filter, by the way. It's a great game. Sly Collection, PS3. Sly Cooper, Thieves in Time, PS3. Bentley's Hack Pack, PS3. Toy Story 3, which is a PSP game. Kingdoms of Paradise, a PSP. Finally getting PSP games on this. I think there was one prior as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, actually, these are already gone, so I will not read that. Very strong month, I want to say, for this uh, service. Very, very impressed. Dragon Ball Z Universe 2, if you're a Dragon Ball fan, Watch Dogs 2, fantastic game. And I, I mean that with all my heart. This was a great game. One of my favorite open world games at the time. It, it was a, uh, If I remember correctly, this was a pretty um, stacked year. So it, it was pretty high on the list given what was coming out that year. I loved this game. Everyone go try it. I loved Marcus. I loved him. Uh, the missions, the DLC was really fun. Really, just go give it a chance. I, I loved that. Origins, great game. We talked about Assassin's Creed earlier. Deathloop, very, very good. I love Deathloop. So, three games from me. Um, yeah, Dan, you got anything to say about that list before I move on? Oh, yeah. The Origins is fantastic. Rayman Legends back in the day was fantastic, so that's cool to get that up there. And Deathloop is fascinating because... Uh, we're approaching the one year anniversary of Deathloop, which yep. maybe it's coming to Game Pass then soon. Maybe. Uh, 
one year exclusivity so yeah who knows that could be anything of course uh as a reminder that was bethesda made before they were purchased so who knows what that means it could have been an exclusive rights on plus after a year of launch so maybe it's hitting there and then it will hit its time span and then it's free on game pass who knows It, it really is up to whoever wrote the legal agreement we'll see yeah, we'll see. We'll see September 20th. If it's not on Game Pass that day, we know, OK, it's probably when whatever this window is done for yeah. Deathloop. Games with gold for September. You want to talk about a huge high? Let's go over down for a huge fall for these four games. All right. Except for, <laughs> except for one. I'll be fair. Except for one. Gods Will Fall will be your Xbox One game uh, from September 1st to September 30th. I have not played this game. So I don't know too much about it. Double Kick Hero, September 16th to October 15th. That's also your Xbox One game. Thrillville, which is incredi- incredibly nostalgic for, I'm sure, a lot of people listening. That's an original Xbox title, September 1st to the 15th. And then Xbox 360, September 16th to September 30th. One of the best games ever made, Portal 2. We're making its way to Games with Gold. You ensure you are there September 16th, Achievers, to get Portal 2 if you do not already have it. That is a mandatory at least try to see if you like the game. It's an incredible game. Loved Portal 2. Loved it so much. Absolutely. That, I echo that. Yes, that, Dan, is the news for the week. I'd like to end the show, just like I began, I ask my co-host a single question. That is, of course, what do you have queued up for the week? This, of course, can be a podcast, a TV show, a movie, manga, if you're Ro, um, a, a comic book, a book, really anything. Dan, tell me, please, you host Podcast BXN, tell me, what do you have queued? I'll give you a little bit of of, uh, TV and games. Uh, So I've started Midnight Mass, and I've been very much enjoying it. Uh, I'm on episode three. Um, It's also fascinating from a different lens because I'm actually, I am a practicing Catholic, so it's interesting to see like the dichotomy or the comparison of the show and like the the faith. So it's very interesting. Very uh, very I'm, rare to have a Christian game. So that's that's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. almost everyone's uh, a fucking atheist around here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Don't worry, you'll get the last laugh. There will all be in hell. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> I'm messing uh, with you, Dan. Keep going. <laughs> my uh so my games halo 3 we are planning on uh playing four player co-op with the whole podcast pxn crew this weekend uh we obviously got through halo 2 so halo 3 is on the docket that's so cool but, yes very excited for them to play it for the first time gage and uh or i'm sorry not gage Ro Ro and, christian. and christian yeah yeah for the first time and halo 3 is my favorite video game of all time so will this I, be I, streamed or is this a video or is this just you guys hanging out it's just us hanging out. That's but, cool. That's uh, cool. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So, uh, and then, of course, The Last of Us Part One yep. comes out tomorrow. Yeah. So definitely yep. going to be picking that up and playing mm-hmm. it. For sure. I haven't. Fun fact: I haven't played The Last of Us since 2013. Oh, okay, okay. okay. I, I only played it one time, and I absolutely loved the game. Uh, I even bought the remaster, but I only played Left Behind, the Left Behind DLC. That's the only thing I played in the remaster. <laughs> So. so I hadn't pl- I played it in 2015. I want to say I bought the PS4 bundle with Last of Us. Now I did own a PS3. It's just I didn't have a, enough money to buy like both things for both games. So I usually if it was a game, I was buying something for 360. So I hadn't I didn't play it until 2014. And I should be correct. I don't believe I've played it since. Pretty sure. So this will be, I'm right there with you, uh, just a year off, really. Yeah. Uh, I'll be playing it again, and I'll be curious to see my thoughts. I imagine it'll be glowing, as I always glow about anything that uh, Naughty Dog does. Uh, I, what I've queued up, um, we just finished Harley Quinn, the HBO Max series. Hilarious show. Check that out if you'd like. Um, if you like, like heroes or anything, they make fun of a lot of stuff. It's very fun. So I finished that. What are we? What is up? There? Oh, oh, we have the. Um, I don't know if you've kept up with this, Dan, uh, but we yeah. have. Uh, I have uh, the list. Um, Emmett Watkins Jr. made fun of my movie knowledge, so I have to watch these movies list. 
Yes. And yes. Uh, yeah, so there'll be something on this list that I will probably be watching because, of course, um, I have, and I quote, the knowledge of a college dorm room. So <laughs> I will, I have to watch some of these movies. I watched In Glorious Bathers. That was really good. I'm in between a couple. Um, maybe we'll watch Mad Max. Maybe we'll watch Zombieland 2. Departed, I'm interested in. Uh, Us, another good one. Um, Forrest Gump, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. There will be a movie I'll talk about next week. Um, maybe Judas and the Black Messiah. Maybe we'll watch that one. There's a couple of these that are bunching out at me. Enola Holmes. That sounds fun. There, there's so many. I literally have over 60 movies on this thing. Um, so I will be literally watching this for a year straight, which is, <laughs> which is going to be fun. Um, aside from that, I uh, oh, at Last of Us Part 1, of course, I'll be playing that. Um, I'm going to try and get to Prey, and I, I haven't... I don't know if if you're going to be playing this, um, Dan, but uh, did you try or are interested in trying at all Saints Row? So, oh, I I love I loved Saints Row three. That was my favorite Saints Row by far. Uh, Saints Row four was fun, but it was more like a crackdown game. Uh, Saints Row two was definitely a big leap from the first game. Saints Row reboot. I'm up in the air on it because I, I, I see a lot of people saying it's fun uh, and I like the franchise uh, overall, but I'm not sure if it's going to be worth paying full price for just because it still has, you know, some of that jank, I guess. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's pretty so. buggy. My um, uh, yeah. former co-host, Alex, actually just finished it and uh, it's pretty buggy still. So if that's a problem, I'm, I wouldn't be shocked if this is literally half off in the next three weeks. So what? Like, yeah. Just wait, and Just I'm sure yeah. I'm sure most bugs will be fixed by then, or at least the vast majority of them. Um, I also yeah. have been hearing good things now. The, of course, the reviews themselves were incredibly, incredibly sour on the game, so not a lot of people enjoy the game. But I have seen a lot of the what would I even call the uh, outside of the gaming space? I I don't know what you, what you would call them. People like Emmett Watkins Jr., Alex. I've seen people saying what you're saying that they are enjoying it still. Um, although you you would assume they wouldn't based on their views, so I find that interesting. I have seen a little bit of the discourse online as well with like um I follow like a PlayStation Reddit for like trophies and things. Someone put someone put on I feel like I played a different game than the reviews did, and it had him platinuming the game, and I was like that's interesting to think about. Um, uh, but I will I started the game, and I will say this every time I like something. Something happens and I don't like it. I think that's the best way I can I describe the game. So I'll give you one example. There was a scene uh, very near the beginning of the game where he walks in and he puts his gun on a coat rack. It's very funny. It's very funny, right? He just walks in, puts his gun on his coat rack like a jacket. It's pretty funny. It was unexpected. It made me chuckle. But then later in that same scene, it ends with a character with a shirt off. And uh, and he made eggs, and the characters were like, "Oh, you know, these eggs would be better with your shirt on." And he was like, "Oh, but it's eggs in a show." And he like poses, and I was like, "Oh my god, is this Full House? The fuck did I just watch?" Like that, this <laughs> that that the tone was like, "Oh, like all the way like from here," and like went completely opposite direction. And so it was just a weird thing. They all laughed like, and the thing was fading out while scooping away. And I was like, whoa, this feels like a completely different game, like uh, scene wise. So that, that was strange. So I do find myself every single time I like something, it's almost immediately followed by something. I'm like, oh, you could have done that way better. Oh my God, that was really bad. So we'll have to see. I am, uh, I am disappointed. I was really hoping this was going to be Saints Row 2 with the absurdity of 4 with like the satire of GTA in like this perfect amalgamation and it seems like it's not that. It seems like it's trying to be a more millennial focused comedy maybe with like a sprinkle of an attempt at a GTA like story and it just no. I don't think it's working but I'll, I'll keep playing it like achievers know. That's the show. That's it. I'm, I still have power unless God uh, strikes us down. I should be good to close out the show. First off, Dan, thank you so much for joining me this week. You are a great, great host. I thank you so much. Now, um, where can the <clears throat> people call you? I know we already talked about it, but tell us, tell us all the things. When do you post? When is all that good stuff? Tell me. 
Yes. Thank you for having me. Like those very gracious. Thank you uh, again for that. But uh, we post every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. We're live uh, on YouTube and Twitch podcast PXN. Very wise, by the way, I find Uh, I saw that uh, you post both. I was like, ah, that's very wise of you. Um, I don't know whose idea that was, but I was like, oh, wow, that is a very good idea. If you are going to stream, do it in both places. And it seems like you guys are doing it pretty easily uh, at least from a viewer's point of view it seems like you guys are doing it pretty um yeah. uh easily and you are still engaged while doing a show which is very talent uh very talented of you guys so congrats on on everything yeah uh follow us at podcast pxn on twitter and i'm at dan is dtm so yeah thank you for uh having me on and joining our escapades the last couple of weeks it's been fun course. thank you for thank you for being yeah. so gracious and uh, allowing me to having a little bit of the fun it's it's i've had a great time and uh achievers thank you so much for listening to this easy achievers game podcast for of course the week of september 1st we are gonna go i'm gonna hope that nothing crazy it looks like it's died outside a little bit it does look a little scary it's that kind of storm gray outside it's where it's you like you don't know if something terrible is about to happen or if it's done yet but we're gonna see we're gonna see but thank you again dan and thank you for listening and remember Go, Chief.